University, who will give a talk on the arithmetic of case free surfaces. So when say I'm talking to a scientist now and says, you know, we have no number theorists here, and so I could have easily done a title of geometry of case free surfaces. <laughs> because in fact, what I'm really interested in is geometric properties of the surfaces as they're reflected in the number theory properties. And so I, in some sense, the key things here are geometric constructions that allow you to say things about number theoretic problems. And so I, you should see this as basically a geometry talk. I will not be standing. So, <laughs> so, I, so I, however, I should say a little bit about what our K3 surface is. Uh, well, at the risk of uh, saying things that many of you already know, so D3 actually refers to, and this came up at lunch, so I'll just repeat it, to, so there's Kadara, Kaler, and Kummer. And this coinage, I believe, goes back to Bay. I don't know the history that well. Um, but Bay was one of the first people to look at these as a class of surfaces across the board. Uh, and he named them in honor of these three mathematicians would contribute to them, and also in honor of the mountain K2, which had just been climbed as he was doing this. So let me tell you a little bit about them, and I'm going to do it from a complex geometry perspective to start. So I want to think of these initially as objects of complex geometry rather than objects of number theory. So here's the definition. <coughs> so a K3 surface It's a compact, complex surface. <laughs> so this point, do do complex dimensions. Yeah. So this means that the complex dimension is equal to two. So these are four manifolds. Um, so, so the key properties are, first of all, that X has no no holomorphic one forms. So in particular, we'll have that the first study number is equal to zero. And secondly, that x has an everywhere non-degenerate holomorphic two form. Omega. And so in some sense, the way I, I like to think about these is these are symplectic objects. So this holomorphic two-form will automatically be closed. And so these are objects in complex geometry that have a lot of symplectic properties. So in Bayes' time, it wasn't known that they were all Kähler so yeah, so, and it's a uh, corollary. So let's but, see. Um, uh, so, so it was a theorem, I guess, of Sue that all K3 surfaces are all Kähler. And so you you deduce you deduce some of the structural properties from the from the Kähler assumption. And so I guess I should mention this is one of the basic properties. No, I may as well start with that property that, that X is automatically Kähler. X is simply connected. And you can interpret this as saying that the first term class of the tangent bundle of X is trivial. This is, if you have a non-degenerate two-form, it trivializes the determinant of the holomorphic tangent bundle. And there's a unique deformation equivalence class. That is, I mean, these relatively weak assumptions determine a K3 surface up to complex analytic deformations. So it's a very interesting problem to try to uh, get analogous classifications in, in for four dimensional objects with, with similar structure. So this is a very interesting problem. The underlying differential four manifold is unique. Yes, and in fact, even if you look at the, there's a connected space of complex structures. If you look at the, the space, LA space parameterizing all the possible complex structures, they're connected. 
But what does deformation mean in this context? So deformation is in the context of deforming complex structures on manifolds. So if we do, okay. if you have any two K three surfaces, there's a, a deformation of complex structures with the connected base taking one to the other. Okay. So and in particular, I may as well just tell you since there, since there, a unique deformation equivalence class, the second Betty number, which is the only Betty number I haven't told you, is equal to 22. That follows. That's obvious. But that's obvious. From the default. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Topologists no, no. can see this. No, no. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, in fact, from my point of view, I'm really only going to look at the protective example. So, so from now on, I'll always assume that x is protective. That is, it's in, x is embedded in a complex projective space. And, and I can interpret it as being defined by some polynomial equation. So I'm really interested in these as objects in algebraic geometry, but they really live as objects in complex geometry. It's so, sort of a non-generic thing. Yeah, so if, if, certainly if you look at the generic deformation of complex structure, if you start off protective, it may be non-protective. You know, it will be non-protective. So you lose the protectivity if you take a generic deformation of complex structure. So let me give some examples. Does that mean there's a unique projective in each, in each deformation class? I'm sorry? Does that mean there's a unique projective in each deformation class? So if you look at the if you look at the projective K3 surfaces, that is the K3 surface along with a cohomology class of a hyperplane section. So there's a, there's a numerical invariant, which is a degree. So if I have, the, if I have, so let's say that H is a class of a hyperplane section. And H2 of X. So then I can look at the degree of X and just define this to be the self-intersection of H. And this is an even integer, positive integer. And if I assume that H is primitive, that is, it's not a multiple of another class, this is actually an invariant. So you have a whole bunch of different kinds of projective K3 surfaces. So examples well, is I could take a quartic hypersurface. So here's a concrete one. Or in general, any quartic will do. As long as it's not non singular. So this is an example of a degree 4K3 surface. So another example is I can take a branch double cover examples of K3 surfaces. Um, let's see. So I'll, let me say one last general thing. So
it might help to answer Tony's question to say that the number of parameters, uh, the, the complex structure depends upon. Yeah, yeah, that's the next sentence. Um, so in fact, there's a, so for, if, if we fix D and N, so if you let K of D be the degree 2D K3 surfaces, so this, this is parameterized by an analytic space. In fact, even a quasi projective variety of dimension 19. One dimension less than the number of deformations of complex structure. And so we have K3 surfaces. Um, we have an infinite series of examples like this. Degree 2, degree 4, degree 6. And as you take larger degrees, the equations become more complex. Like if your surfaces have more intricate geometry as the degree increases. So there's one last thing I want to mention. So I want to give a very brief. Are they disjoint? Well, it, it depends on whether you have pairs consisting of K3 surfaces. So I could have pairs of K3 surfaces with the choice of polarization. But you can have abstract K3 surfaces that have multiple polarizations. So if I just, if you, if I just give you a K3 surface, sometimes you can think of it as having degree 4. But if you use a different, if you use a different hyperplane class, it could be a degree 2. So you have many possible degrees. And so let me I'm actually say something about a brief taxonomy of K3 surfaces, keeping this in mind. So, let me write out one last definition. So, so a K3 surface acts, and again, this is always productive. is general if it's embedding in projective space is essentially unique. All right, I'm going to give a mathematically precise formulation of this. So, if I look at the isomorphism classes of line bubbles on the K3 surface, I want this to be single. And there is a, a unique positive generator that comes from hyperbolic classes. So this is the notion of being general. Now, other K3 surfaces can have lots of different divisors. So, 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 pick of x is equal to a three abelian group of length rho, where rho can be, so we can have, have that the number of these line bundles, the rank is equal to rho, where rho is anything between 1 and 20. And so whenever rho is greater than or equal to 2, x has multiple Realizations. That's a projective object. So let me take this example. So this is a Fermat microsurface. It has a lot of structure. So here, with a bit of work, you can show that Rho of x is equal to 20. There's a lot of lines in here, for instance. So I can write down a huge number of lines just by taking x equals y, w equals e, permuting over the fourth roots of unity. So there's lots of, there's lots of divisors. There's lots of different line bundles in, the, in this. So I have a multitude of ways of realizing this as a projective surface. I actually don't want to look at these examples. I'm really primarily interested in the general case of surfaces because I don't want to get distracted by too much additional geometry. 
I want to keep the geometry sort of as simple as possible. And so for my purposes, I'm going to assume that there's a essentially unique embedding into projective space. I guess it's a theorem that's been swept, swept under the rug that for each degree that the general ones are in fact dense set of the Yes. So this is absolutely true that if we so these are the, so we have but could you explain what it means for a surface to have two different projective interpretations or instantiations or whatever? So I, maybe I can give an example. Okay. Um, so hopefully an example will answer the question. So I could take a surface X and P2 cross P2, okay? And I want the surface to be defined by two forms. U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. These both have to be zero. Where this is linear in the U's and quadratic in the X's. And this is quadratic in the x's and linear in the u's. So with a bit of work, you can show this is a K3 surface. The reason why I'm giving this, though, is that I can map it onto this P2, or I can map it onto this P2. And you know, I have different ways of thinking about it as a degree 2 K3 surface, the different projections. So if I have a surface that can be embedded into a product of projective spaces, depending on whether I think of it as in the first factor or the second factor, there's, they, have, they have different lives as projective varieties. So I, I don't know if that. But it doesn't sit inside either of them, right? Oh, uh, I could take a big, big projective space. Yeah. Sometimes P2 sits in the big projective space. I can put this into, uh, yeah, I can, I can put it into a bigger projective space. Take polynomials of different degrees. On yeah. That. This, I could have done an example in P3 cross P3 too. So, so the point is that, yeah, I could have. I'm not going to another example. Start with the quadrant. Maybe P1 like P1 is easier to see than K3. Yeah, there are many. I'm listening to both of you. You said it doesn't sit in either one. He didn't hear you say you project in either one. So <coughs> not sitting in, you project. So in, in this, so so let me step back a little bit. So it, let's let me go back here. So if I take, so I have this finite map onto P2, and I can, if I take multiples of so there's an embedding of this into a high-dimensional projective space, where the hyperplane class is a multiple of the pullback of the line from P2. So I actually need this. This is actually the main example I want to look at. And so even though it's not a perfect example to illustrate the general principle, I have to talk about it because it's the main example I'm actually present theorems about. Um, I could take another example with more complicated equations that would actually be embedded in P3 cross P3 with more complicated multi-homogeneous equations. And then you would actually see an embedded in both sides. By projection. By projection. So let me turn and talk about the basic questions I want to address. So here are the questions. I want to address questions. So now this is as much number theory as I'm going to do, which is basically just to state the problems that are relevant. Or so let's say that K is a number field. And I want X to be a K3 surface with equations having coefficients in K. So for example, if, if I took K equals Q, the Fermat example has equations with coefficients over over the rational numbers. So when you do this, it makes sense to look at the, the points. So you can look at the points of x with coefficients in the 
I think that the money would be that this is not undecidable because I'm going to propose a method for actually deciding it. <laughs> uh, that could be wrong. It could be wrong. You, you know, you, who knows? So, there's only yet examples of both both behaviors. So, for for example, um, I could look at a case, I could look at this example. So this is a K3 surface that doesn't have any solutions over the rational numbers. So there are things, that, easy things that you can do to get no solutions. Because it doesn't have any solutions over the numbers. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's actually one of the easy ways of decide, of showing that something doesn't have solutions. Good point. <laughs> oh, uh, so this is such a good point. I'm going to write it down. Maybe even call. So. So here's the idea. So if we have, if x is contained in R, then xk not empty implies that, of course, xr is not empty, and the contrapositive, if you have no real points, yeah. you have no points. So this is the, one of the easier ways of checking. In, in fact, if you have a set of solutions over the real numbers, there is an algorithm for deciding whether they have a solution or not. So this is, this is OK. Now, all right, so here's a place where I'm going to drift a little bit into number theory. So I mean, this is like a com completion of Q, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to allow myself other completions of Q. I mean, you know, L is like R, but number theorists, they, they go for the piatics. So I could also. Take a piatic field. So like QP, for instance. And so if you have solutions, you also have solutions of the piatics. For every piatic field, you have solutions. So, so this is one way of deciding whether you have solutions. So there's another thing, which I'm not going to talk about very much. There's another cohomological test. I, I kind of missed something. That, in that first thing with the reals, you assume k was a real field. And then you make that deduction. Yes. Now to make the corresponding 
And then you said something about therefore for all primes. Yeah, so if I assume that K is contained in a in some chaotic field. Oh. Yeah. So I take some chaotic field that contains K. So then then okay. I thought you said something for all primes. Oh. Well there I mean there are many chaotic if K is Q, I can take Q two or Q three or Q four or Q four. Q2, Q3, Q5, Q7. <laughs> I can take any, any of the categories. And so, so this gives you an infinite number of things that you can track. But it turns out that there's only a finite number of things to try. It's not so hard to show that this is actually something. So this is trackable. So the complete field is trackable. Yes. So here's a, a question that was open until quite recently. So this was a this was a question that was open until about six months ago. So suppose that X is, is a general case free surface. So general in the geometric sense I was defining before, right? I think of it as a complex manifold. And I want that the Picard group is rank one, and there's only one way of embedding in protective space. Then let's assume it's defined over K, a number field. And let's suppose that for, for each completion, K being containing K including R and C, that we have a point over the completions. So then, so is X K on it? So I'm going to brush the chronological test under the rug because I don't want to talk about it. But in fact, it wasn't even known whether this approach that was suggested from the audience, natural approach to check the completion, whether that's enough. So this is an open problem. So one of the theorems I want to present is that, so here's a quick statement of the theorem. So I'm, this, I'm going to give a proper statement in a little while, but me, this is joint work with really Alvarado and really who are brothers even though they have different last names. So the theorem is that not necessarily. So in fact there's this concrete example of a degree 2K3 surface in the sense I defined before where you over all the chaotics, you have solutions, but there's no solution over, over, over Q. Is this an example where the cohomological test is successful? Or the cohomological test is successful. So this but it's is actually example explained by the cohomological test. Yes, the cohomological test is successful, um, but it's actually hard to produce examples where you have a cohomological test in this situation. It's actually quite different. Okay. So, in some sense, the theme of my talk is, is looking at properties of general K3 surfaces in, a ge in the geometric sense I define them, and analyzing what kind of arithmetic properties they have, and how we can use the generality to, to, to do construction from, you know, to, to prove theorems about number theory. Now, what makes this result run is actually all geometry, believe it or not. But the key thing is to find the geometry that actually allows us to get something for the number theorists to do. You know, in some sense, the, the geometric instructions tell you how to, you know, it gives the like, people who do got a cohomology something to try. So in the example that you're looking at is KQ or is it something more complicated? Yeah, so the specific example is for K equals Q. So there's another class of questions that I would like to look at. 
which is actually related to this, but probably more geometrical. So, so the second class of questions are questions on rational curves. I'm going to draw a picture now which shows the fact that I'm a, an algebraic geometer, not a real geometer, I mean an honest geometer. So I'm going to draw a picture of x. I'm going to draw it like a surface, even though it's a four hole. So here's how I think about x. Here's how I think about CP1. I always get in trouble when I do this from the geometer but It's not CP1, but I hope you can bear with me. So what I want to do is I want to look at the image of of a, a map it's called phi from CP1 into X. So I get some curve, probably crossing itself, but you get a curve in X. And there's a very basic question about this. Well, let me make an observation and then I'll take a question. So rational curves don't deform. You can't cover a K3 surface by rational curves because, because of the whole over 2 form. I mean, if, if it's a form, then you would have a family of rational curves, and that violates the, having the whole over 2 form on X. So these are, in some sense, discrete things. They're sort of kind of stuck there. They're not, they're not going to move around. Are you saying each of these is the front here? I'm sorry. Are you saying each no. of these is the branching? Oh, okay. Obviously, it's the branching because it's one dimensional, but um, holomorphic with respect to the given complex structure. They're, they're holomorphic with branching. I mean, well, two forms uh, so are obviously if I, one dimensional. If they were to deform, then I would have some, some P1 bundle over a Riemann surface mapping onto this trajectively, and that's trouble because what can the two form pull back to? So if it's P1 times a disk, then you take the. You, Take the subtraction of the derivative with respect to the disk variable, and you get a one form on P1. And there aren't any. Okay. So here's a question. So we know that these don't move in families. So the question is so does X emit infinitely many rational curves? Or the finite, finite number. Now this is a vexing question because the physicists tell us how to count these. <laughs> and the physicists, I think, would tell us that they're not a finite number. Um, but what the physicists are counting is this deep and subtle thing, which, you know, as a working out the great geometer, I have to scratch my head again. So it's not quite clear that the numbers that the physicists tell us actually force it to be an infinite number of rational curves. So, so this is this is an, still an open problem, in fact. This is also quite important. So I want to say a little bit about what we can, what we do know about this. 
So, how about a one homology? No. So then there's finite number. Um, yeah. So if you fix the homology class, so all the all the curves of the homology class they form a projective space. Um, so when I'm basic, and the rational curves are some sub variety of that projective space, which is which has dimension zero. So, so it has to be finite. And it's, this is algebra, these are all algebra geometrically defined. So if you fix the homology class, there's always a finite number. And that's actually what I think the physicists like to count. You know, they, they fix the homology class, they count the number, they build beautiful generating series, they get modular forms. You know, this is a great thing to do. Um, but the things, that they the things that they count, well, it gets confusing if you have something like this. Maybe I have a rational curve that consists of something that's one rational curve and another rational curve with multiplicities, meaning in some complicated way. It quickly gets confusing as to exactly how to count these things and how they would contribute to whatever the physicists are computing. So these can be a pain. So the, let, me, let me talk a little bit about theorems that, were, that give some you said the physicist count includes the multiplicity structures. So the, what the physicist counts is or not or the opposite. I couldn't tell what the physicist. So the physicists have um, a way of interpreting this as a problem in Gromov-Witten theory, and so they compute Gromov-Witten invariance. And then there's a way of kind of renormalizing Gromov-Witten invariance so you get something that looks like it should be integral. And then the, these these integers have some beautiful generating series. And so. But it, it's all from Grimaud Witten theory. So it's not quite clear whether the things are counting are honest images of CP1 in the sense that that would mean them as an algebraic geometry. But, but I, I think uh, in Grimaud Witten theory, actually, we are counting curves, not necessarily in one complex. Otherwise, it's zero, because you can always be here. So I form the complex strategy to be almost complex. Yeah, so I guess there's a, you have to, so I, I'm not going to probably say. Yeah. But you have to take this ultimate alternate, this alternate approach, the reduced virtual. No, it's not reduced virtual. It's a, you they probably have to like. Yeah. So you take the twister yeah. deformation and then count. I guess. So there's right. a ways of doing this. Yeah. But that's not what I want to talk about. Okay. So I'm not going to say anything more about it. So, so anyway, that does not imply. Uh, does not give you an answer to this question. I said the Grimaud Witten theorists. I didn't. For, I, when I, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful paper by the Grimaud Witten theorists that use techniques from Grimaud Witten theory to count. Um, but I, I, I don't want to, I don't have much more. I can't say anything interesting about what we're doing. Okay, so let me say something about this. So, so, so some remarks. So already, Mori Mukai showed in the 1980s, in fact, that most K3 surfaces, say in a given space KB, emit infinitely many rational curves. Where most means in a complement of a countable union of analytic submanifolds of the parameter space. I would say general, except it's not the same as this general. It's different than this general. But, uh, so most in general are different. But, so, but a lot of these are general. So I'm sure most of these would be general. I don't know. Uh, I you're taking the you're, you're only throwing out posts. Yeah, so certainly there is a, yeah, so. No, I'm hearing about This most is like bare category? This? Yeah. So I take a, a countable number of, of sub varieties, you know, find my polynomial equations, I remove them all, and I still have something left. And so, really. What is case of B there? I'm sorry? Curly case of B. Oh, so this is the K3 surfaces of degree 2D. So I'm fixing the K3 surfaces with given protective invariants. That's true for each D, therefore. Actually, it's true for all of them. Yeah. I mean, for all the ones that are protective. Um, 
But the thing that's a little unsatisfying this is it, it says, so the, the argument says, says little about any particular case. So if I actually give you a 23K3 surface, they don't give you a test for deciding whether it's one of the most, where the argument works. So, is the, you know, if being a, I'm kind of a concrete guy, so if give me a K3 surface, I want to tell you whether it's with any or no. And the argument doesn't do that very well. I mean, it's hard. It, it's, it's hard. Certainly, for not, it doesn't say, it's a little for any particular <coughs> general K3 surface. Again, general might sense where the, where the Picard group it's cyclic. Um, to answer the question, so <coughs> the last thing, so the, qu the question actually reduces to the case of K3 surfaces over a number of fields. So if I could do this for the K3 surfaces over a number field, I could do it in general. And so this is basically a deformation argument. So I really, in some sense, while this looks like a complex geometry question, if I want to, I could make it into a number theory question. You can argue whether that's a good idea or bad. But you can do that. So the last thing I want to say is that, so maybe I'll keep this. This, this over here. So before 2009. So what do you mean by that statement? This statement. That it reduces to. So this is true for all x if true for all x defined over number of fields. So that's what's believed to be true. They all have infinitely many. They should all have infinitely many. But if I want to prove it, I don't have to prove it for ones you know, that have e's and pi's in the coefficients. I can prove it for ones that just have nice algebraic numbers in the coefficients. So the, con the, the conver converse is not logically no. clear. No, but this this is this is this is pretty straightforward to prove. Okay, so before two thousand nine, there was in fact no example known of a K three surface that's general over a number field. With infinitely many So there's not a single example now of a general K3 surface with infinitely many rational curves. So for special K3 surfaces, there's lots of tricks that you can do, like use symmetries, you can use there's, there's tricky things that you can do to produce infinitely many rational curves. In my definition, that's cheating. Using a symmetry or something that's ad hoc that doesn't really reflect the geometry of the K3 surface, it reflects the beauty of some dynamical system that happens to act on the K3 surface. So, so the theorem I want, the other theorem I want to say something about, the time I have left. Is that Kurt McMullen's theorem on the So Kurt McMullen has certainly done work on K3, on the so dynamics. We were just talking about it. So Kurt McMullen has done work on the dynamics of K3 surfaces. I mean, I wrote down an example over there in mapping to P2 cross P2. And it, these two non-commuting involutions give you a lot of dynamical properties that you could study. But I don't want to do that. That's sort of what I want to my intention. Is this 
These are the same services of which it's known that most of them do have been. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's a little strange. So most of them do, but you know, again, for any particular one, you just don't know. It's like transcendental number. It's yeah. like a lower differentiable continuous function, right? One down. I, yeah, I, same thing. Maybe not quite the same flaw. Well. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. All right. So here's the theorem. And so this, so I'm going to state this. So then, so this, this, this is work I did with both of them and the extension is due to Jolie and Lisa. So we did the degree two case, and they did the higher degree cases. The theorem is so if x is a general K3 surface. over a number field, then x has infinitely many rational curves. So, It's not open. General. General is important. Uh, uh, uh. Now, for most special K3 surfaces, there's like a dynamical system or automorphism or some special structure that would give you. So the ones that are not known to have infinitely many rational curves are special, but in a very limited way. There's like a, basically there's a list of them I could give you. So are they known not to have infinitely many or just not known to have? Um, I think that it, uh, the expectation is that every K3 surface would have infinitely many rational curves. But, and this is still general in the sense of Picard number one. Yes, general in the sense of Picard number one. We actually use this, well, you can get by on Picard number is fine for this. So, but, yeah. But the result is like if Picard number is larger than three or something. If the Picard number is really big, then you also have an infinite number of rational curves. So the ones that don't work, they're actually a, a fairly short list of K2 surfaces of programming two and four. We're actually kind of almost done with this program. Does this question make sense for non-projective papers? Well, if you, I mean, it, let's see. I think it doesn't. You don't expect to have any curves. You don't expect to have any curves at all. No, you right. could have. Well, I think that so you could only have a finite. I think you could only have a finite number. I mean, if you have a non-projective K three surface, can you have an infinite number of curves, destroyed curves with negative stuff? I mean, I think that there's all you have to show is the algebraic dimension is positive, right? So then, yeah. yeah, I think I think it doesn't. I think it's not a good question for yeah. the answer. Is yeah. No. Yeah. The answer is no for a general one. Okay. Let's use the algebraic structure. Okay, so, and so I guess I should, let me say a little bit more about, I should have just probably stated the theorem here precisely before, since, so there exists a general degree two, a tree surface, over Q with <coughs> real points, static points, but no points of the rations. So unfortunately, I only have about five or seven minutes left, and so I'll I'm just going to tell you the geometric ingredients, because these things are really geometric. Not the statements, not misunderstanding. Are you supposed to understand these questions are related? I'm sorry? That these questions are related? Well, so 
So the role, the role of generality is the common theme here. I mean, the goal is to, to state things about general K3 surfaces. And using the, the general properties of the K3 surfaces to get information. So in terms of the, in terms of the technical machinery behind it, the generality is important. To you. The generality actually gives common things. But it's mostly on the level, actually, of the number theory. So I'm going to suppress the common, the commonality in the proofs and just emphasize the geometric instructions that I think are interesting. So let's see. So let me call this theorem 2 and theorem 1. So let me say something about theorem 2 first. So here's a, here's a geometry. Behind theorem two. So the basic strategy is to do something like the set for K three. So let me tell you what this is in geometric terms. I want to exhibit varieties y mapping to x, which are fiber over x in Kr. So the protected one was over, over x, our K3 surface, so that Um, if x is not empty, then y is not empty. So this is the basic approach. So we want, so, so I, I want to exhibit a fiber bundle, bundle, I mean an algebraic in the final over q, so that if you have points here, you definitely have points here because it's this map. But I want to show that if there are points here, then there have to be points up here. So descent and ascent. No, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So, and, and basically, the input data for y. And the data that determines this should be a cohomology class. Okay, so for the people keeping score, I actually need this. So the input data that determines y is a cohomology class. And so I mean I want to think of this as an element of like a Brouwer group of y. And so you get some torsion classes in homology. So the, the geometry, so the basic challenge, and this is something that is still largely open. So given so given the class, so how do we find the corresponding geometry y. And so let me, t let me tell you basically how this fits together. So we construct y. What is n here? n is a positive integer. Just any. Well, in fact, in, the, in our paper, n is equal to 2. But I want to lay out the general strategy of how we approach these things. Um, I mean, we exhibit a very concrete vibration, and it's associated with the two torsion class in cohomology. And so the geometry of y comes from looking at a projected geometric construction on x. So I, I maybe I won't say that too much about it, but so this comes by realizing so this is constructed. By realizing 
acts in a special determinantal form. That is, the equations, you have to write them in a special determinantal form. And if I have time, I'll write down a huge determinantal set of equations, but maybe I don't want to do that now. So the idea here is the, you know, the limiting factor is understanding how cohomology classes can be translated into algebra geometry. How do we actually write down concrete fiber bundles which are associated to these in a systematic way? This is actually the thing that really limits further progress in, in these arithmetic questions. So in the two minutes I have left, let me say something about this. So I guess all I have time to do is draw a picture. So the strategy of uh, one is, so, so this is a little bit theoretic. Right? Like we reduce x mod t. And then we show that x mod t has many rational curves. And so when we draw this schematically, so if this is x mod t, I might have a whole bunch of <coughs> rational curves sitting inside the reduction mod p. And then the key thing is that we use deformation theory. So we deform the reducible curves mod p on this curves. deformations really tells us what to do. The proof methods are a little different, but essentially this is a complex geometric motivated argument. Okay, I think I should stop there. Thank you. No questions? Uh, so how different are things when you ask analogous minimum theory questions if you're looking at surfaces of general time? Are there, uh, I, sort of the expectation for a surface of general, I should have said this, but I, I was wondering. If you have a surface where the first term class of the tangent bundle is negative, so in surface, surfaces of general type, it being you know, typical, you, the expectation is that they should have very few rational points. So you might get lucky, you have a sporadic point here or there. You might be lucky you have a rational curve or elliptic curve that happens to sit inside of it. But the, the idea is that there really should be a finite number of rational curves, a finite number of elliptic curves, and a finite number of sporadic points. And beyond that, you have nothing. On the other hand, when the tangent bump, the first term class of the tangent bundle is positive, the expectation is that the points are abundant. And so, when you're in the middle, it's a little less clear what should be going on. Is there a for, a billion, a for a billion varieties, you can always show that after taking a field extension, the points are, are ubiquitous. For a billion varieties, you can show that, act, that you never have rational curves. So the case of a billion varieties kind of leaves you perplexed as to what should be true in general. Because the points and the curves actually, the evidence points in different directions. Uh, so I think it's, an, it's a little less clear what should happen for Calabi-Yau's. Um, I think 
For general globi L, the national curve should be dense. But I don't know. I think for globi L threefold, I don't think people have really looked at these questions systematically. Or maybe some in this room knows more than I do. More questions? Is this eta some kind of characteristic class? Well, so what's happening here, this is corresponding to some co-cycle with coefficients of PGL R plus 1. And I can use that, and I can get a, a co-cycle on H2 mu R plus 1. Now it's basically, I take the, the co-cycle classifying this bundle, apply connection, connecting homomorphism to it roughly, and I How do you end up in Z, Z mod NZ? So if or I do it this way, the connecting homomorphism would be a H2 X Z. But sometimes the, the torsion order is less than expected, roughly. But maybe what Tony's asking is the fundamental group of PGL R plus 1 is the Z mod R plus 1. That's, that's the connection between the two. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's a problem. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's probably a better way to say it in this audience. So repeat what, what Jason said, please. <laughs> you, uh, the, the fundamental group of PGL R plus 1 is Z mod R plus 1 Z. I think that's what you said. Yes. To explain two, quest uh, two questions. One is the existence of rational points, <laughs> and the other is the existence of rational curves. Yes. Are there any relation to a similarity? Oh, well, <laughs> now that you ask, <laughs> <laughs> my collaborator, Bogomola, has the great vision of how this should work. He says every rational point should be contained in a rational curve. Why did, uh, you can't. You can't disprove this very easily. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is a question. If you have a rational point on the K3 surface, does it contain a rational curve? And I think not much is known about this over number fields. There are some nice theorems due to both Malv and Schinkel over finite fields, like for Kuma, Kuma K3 surfaces. So, so is my impression right? So, so basically, you are. A, a final answer to this question, the, the question about the number of rational curves is within reach. I mean, so you mean the a, number? Yeah, the infinite number of not so, 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 so Well, so. I don't, I mean, there are cases I don't know how to do. Like, if I have, I mean, I'll tell you a case I don't know how to do. So if I have a sexy plane curve with a tritangent line, so let's say we have half x, y, z equals 0. This is the sexy plane curve. And I'm assuming it has a tritangent line. And then I look at the K3 surface, y squared equals f, x, y, z. So this K3 surface. So I have two rational curves that come from the preimages of the line. I don't know how to prove this is an infinite number. So here's a concrete case that's still. Yeah, but, but I was saying that. But there's, yeah, there's kind of sporadic examples like this. Yeah, but, but there is some sort of finite list or something. Yeah, but the, I have no idea how to do that case. Yeah. It's not like I know how to do any particular case of this form. I think that there needs to be a new idea mm -hmm. in order to tackle this. I don't, I don't think that taking what's out in the literature and sort of reordering it will give this. I don't think it's like a thesis problem. Can I, can I yeah. that? I want to make a. Kind of Stony Brook differential geometry remark. Okay. <laughs> so, Gromal and Meyer in the 60s, I guess it was the 60s, maybe just before Gromal came here. I mean, the rational curve, let's think of a real analog as, as some kind of metaphorical analog as being like a real version of a rational curve would be a circle. And a geometric version of that would be like a closed geodesic on the remark <coughs> particle. So, just think of that as kind of a Difference of geometric analog. And then these are related to just the same way these curves are related by Gromov Witten theory to some critical points in some discussion. These periodic geodesics are related to critical points of the Morse energy function of the loop space. And Gromov and Meyer proved that, uh, that uh, the 
even though they're not transversal or generic, even in the general degenerate case, they only make a finite contribution to the cohomology. And so if the cohomology is rich, you have to have that interesting net. And that was a famous way to produce. So since that's like the remark, and that's, okay. that's kind of the Stony Brook story that came here. Anyway, and then, but when you showed the K3 surface, the rational curves don't have deformations. That means they're kind of isolated, but they could have degenerates. They're not really transversal solutions. But yeah, like they may not be. Theory, but they may not be. So yeah. if you could prove a homomorphic analog with the Bromo-Meyer theorem, that only, they only contribute in a certain precise way to the cohomological structure of the corresponding. The Bromo fit theory is kind of a cohomological theory mm -hmm. in a big a function space. You can imagine trying to do it that way. Just take a tensor Bromo-Meyer to see. Well, there's some, I mean, there's one, we take one thing, which is not a direct answer, but so if you look at the number of rational curves in the primitive homology class, you try to count those, um, that number is equal to the other characteristic of a compactified configuration space of points on the K3 surface. So, you know, there's an interpretation of that number in the primitive class as a spoiler characteristic of a tact by configuration space or Hilbert scheme. I don't know if that's evidence for your perspective on this or not, but I mean, there's, the numbers have meaning. Right. And maybe that meaning would suggest an interpretation like what you're giving me. So that's quite a question. Like, uh, how many uh, higher-degree curves are there in the numbers? So you can look at, like, like, like genus, genus one curves, passing through a fixed point, genus two curves passing through two fixed points. I mean, you can play these games. I mean, you need to kind of, if you have a genus one curve on a K3 surface, it moves. So you need to pin it down. Once you pin it down, then you can count it. And there are formulas for these. There are lots of formulas for these. Like Brian and Lone have formulas. There's a lot of formulas on it. I don't think I can summarize them easily. Okay, let's thank Brendan again. Thank you.